My name is Vahid Chitsas, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Absolutely. So my name is Erica Robertson, and I am on the East Coast. So it is 4 o'clock our time here. I am in the DMV area. I am located right in between Baltimore and D.C. in Columbia, Maryland. Let's talk about self-development. Well, hopefully you're staying safe. Let's talk about self-development. How important do you think it is for individuals, whether they're an entrepreneur or they're not? How important is self-development? Because I know you've had experience with it, and I think it's a big key, but tell us a couple of key elements that people need to take from this conversation. Absolutely, 100%. I believe, hands down, that self-development is the most important thing in any business that you're in because – in my business in sales, you know, I, I had it backwards for a really long line. I believed it was grind and work, work, work. And then so like work was always at the epitome of everything that I needed to do. And then my relationships were falling second and I was falling third. And so I was always experiencing burnouts and being sick all the time. And I never understood why that was. And when I moved to Maryland about a year and a half ago to help run our office now here, I'm originally from Pittsburgh. When I moved here, I knew there was something wrong. And I knew I needed to make a change. And the only change that I could think of was that I wasn't taking care of myself because I imagined like myself as like a cup filled up completely to start the day. And by the end of the day with me running a team in an organization with so many people who needed me all day long, my cup was drained by the end of the day and I couldn't even give enough to myself. And so I realized I had to flip the script in my own life. I had to put myself back on top because when I took care of myself, I was now able to fill my cup up. And now I was not only able to help myself, but I was able to help more people along the way. So I became number one in my life. And when I'm happy and healthy, everybody wins. And I wasn't letting So tell us, okay, so, so let's get really practical. What were like two or three things that you did that put you on top? Because sometimes when I do that, I feel a little bit selfish, a little bit this. And then my wife questions me, are you putting the family first, faith first, us first? So I don't want to get questioned like that. So tell us, how did you do that? What were a couple of things that you did? Yeah, absolutely. So I, cause it, I call it being a self, like a positive selfishness. Like, so I cause it being positively a selfish for yourself. Because so the main thing I started was I started a gratitude practice every single morning. I have a journal by my bedside. And before I put my feet on the ground, I write down five gra things that I'm gr like grateful for from the day before. Not big things, like really, really small things. Like maybe someone let me into traffic or maybe I was really grateful for that good cup of coffee I had, you know. And then I was able to walk through the rest of my day in a gratitude mindset. Uh, the second thing I did was I stopped looking at my phone for the first 30 minutes every single day. Because as soon as I turned on my phone, I felt like I was in a very reactive state. And I was looking at emails and it wasn't about me. It was about everybody else. So I started to follow my day in a reactive state to everybody else. So I was like, if I just take control of my first 30 minutes of my day, I can now walk in the rest of my day in control. And the third thing that I think changed the most for me was that when I wasn't working, I didn't feel guilty about it. I didn't feel guilty. So when I was at work, I was at work. My priorities were for work and my family understood why I was there because it was for them. You know, I'm away, bec not because of them, but for them, right? And here's the thing, though. Like, when you focus on work while you're working and you're not guilty about your family, when you go home to your family, you got to shut off work. You got to turn off the notifications. You got to turn off the emails. You have to be there, present, put your feet down, turn your phone off, and be present with those people in your life. Because then now you're able to separate the two. And I felt like, I feel like balance is BS. You're never going to have balance in any area of your life. But if you focus on those things that are important while you're there and you're not feeling guilty about it, your life can completely change with that mindset. Not the easiest things to do, <laughs> especially that first 30 minutes. It's a little bit of a, I don't know. I feel like when I, when I, I feel like you do need that 30 minutes to get the day started on the right track. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I make the mistake. I want to put out the fires early on during the day. And my train of thought is this 30 minutes, if I put the fires out, there'll be less throughout the day. So maybe, I don't know. I'm going to try that strategy. Let it go yeah. for 30 extra minute and let's see what happens. Because think about it, in those first 30 minutes of your day, it's not about you, it's about everybody else already. So your cup is already drained. And now it's going to be up to you to help you fill it back up, already taking that energy out of your day. If you start just, the world's not going to burn and crash if you spend the first 30 days with you. Those fires can get put out at 8 o'clock. You know, if it's from 7 to 7.30 and that's your time, that's your time. 
You know, for me, it's sitting on my couch and planning out my day and doing my gratitude and having my cup of coffee and reading and just taking care of me. So I'm completely filled up and I'm ready to give even more to the people in my life. Because when I'm completely filled up, I feel like I can impact people's lives in a better way. So, okay. So let's run, in, let's run through that. Let's just say someone, they got kids, business, sales, entrepreneurship, all that. Let's say we got 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that, if you had that 30 minutes, how would you divide that up? Between journaling, reading, watching a motivational video, I don't know, audio book, how would you divide that? Or is 30 minutes not a, enough time? We should add some more and then you can tell us what are the steps that you would take, how to divide those minutes. Absolutely. Well, first thing first, if you're a parent and if you're waking up at the same time as your kids, you're starting your day off wrong. You got to wake up before them. If they're up at six, you got to be up at five. If they're up at seven, you got to be up at six because you got to start that day for you. And I'm not saying you got to get everything done within that 30 minutes, but do the things that you need to do in those first 30 minutes. So for me, what that looks like is I'm not a morning person. You can ask my boyfriend. I've been grumpy gills from day one, two and a half years ago in this relationship, but I'm starting to enjoy my mornings more because I already have a routine. I think that routine is so important. My first routine is I go to the bathroom, I shower. I have to shower the first thing I wake up because it wakes me up. And while I'm showering, there's a podcast on, there's an audio book on, there's something on because you can get multiple things done at one time. As soon as I'm out of that shower, I'm drinking my green shake because I know I got to put the good things in my belly before I start the day. And then I get my cup of coffee, I sit my butt on the couch and I'm doing my planner right? And I'm looking through all the things I need to get done throughout the day and the things that I might not have gotten done the day before just to plan it out. After that, my 30 minutes is over. My phone is in my hand and now I'm checking emails. Now I'm getting in touch with my team. Now I am on Instagram or I'm, I have a Planoly app that helps me schedule my Instagram posts throughout the week. So I'm not fidgeting all morning trying to come up with content on the fly, right? So I truly think it's about time management and my time management starts on Sunday. I plan out the entire week. So I know everything I do, like literally my planner is right here. I have it completely all laid out, everything I gotta do throughout the week. And then the things that I know as soon as I'm done for the day, I can check them all off. I feel more productive. I feel good about myself. And then I can go enjoy my night and do the things I need to do with my family and myself. Let's just say assumption. Let's just say something, let's say you, um, you had a migraine in the morning. You woke up and you couldn't stick to that routine. Then what happens? When do you go back to it? Because I feel like sometimes my routine, it's flowing, but every maybe two weeks or so, there are things that I'm not in control of that mm -hmm. do come up that maybe my routine is not going to go as planned as the day before or the next day. How would you handle that? To be honest with you, I suffer with chronic migraines. And I've had for a really long time, for eight years, I've suffered with them. And the days that I get them, I am dehabilitated and I'm in bed all day. And I give myself grace. You have to give yourself grace on the days that you don't feel like you get everything done. Or maybe you messed up your routine or now it's a setback. But like, we're human. We're going to have setbacks. We're not machines. We're not robots. If we stick to our schedule, that's fantastic. But if something throws a curveball, you know, as long as you're expecting things to not go perfect and you can re react logically with how to fix it, you have to give yourself grace. You know, you can't just go through life hoping to be perfect and now shame and guilt happen because you're not perfect because that's not what we are. I truly believe if you give yourself grace, it's, a, it's okay to fall down. It's okay to have a setback, but it's not okay to get stuck there. It's not okay to fall down and stay there. You know, we were made for so much more than just to be down and stay down. Like, who are you setting an example for? If you got babies... Those babies are watching you. You can't stay down. You got to get back up for them. What kind of role model you want to be? You're okay to be down for a day. You're allowed to have a bad day. You're allowed to go through a bad season, but it's how you get out of it is what's going to set the example for who you want to follow you. I agree with that 100%. Thank you for that. So here's my other question. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of individuals that right now they're going through their nine to five uh, job and they might be having challenges or thoughts about, is this my career? This is what I want to do for future. When you wanted to do the transition or if somebody wants to do that transition, what are some of your recommendations for those individuals? Well, I'm a believer if you half fast anything, you'll never get anything done. And I'm also a firm believer that what you focus on becomes your priority. When you focus on everything, you focus on nothing. 
And so I believe like if you drop, there's people that are in a nine to five, but they're like, oh, well, I want to have this side gig and I also want to lose weight and I also want to take care of my body and I also want to get my meditation in and I want to do this, 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 and this. That's fine. You can have as many goals as possible, but I truly believe you can only focus on one thing at a time. Imagine you have a bunch of like pebbles and you drop them into a lake. They're going to create tiny, tiny little impacts. But imagine you have a boulder and you drop it. That impact, that ripple effect will go so far out because when you improve one area of your life, all the rest rise. When a boat comes into the harbor, the water rises, it brings all the boats up with it. So for people who want to transition, you have to make the commitment. You either go all in or you don't. And it's scary because it's change, it's uncertainty, but nothing grows in our comfort zone. You're either growing or you're dying. What makes me have that internal motivation to make that change when I really want to make it done is I think about me being on my deathbed 80, 90 years from now and looking back on my life and knowing if I had that regret that I didn't make that change because you're the only one in the rank. I don't care about the other people's opinion on why they think you shouldn't do it or why she says you shouldn't or why they think you can never get there because they're not the one in the ring, but they're not going to be the one that lives with the regret that I do if I never make that change for who I want to become. So I think of somebody who is listening to this right now, who is feeling stuck in this area, you know, in the transition in their life where they don't know if they can go all in or not. Well, my first question is, are you 100% committed in the belief that you can do it? Because if you don't believe in yourself, that it'll never happen for you. You got to first truly believe and manifest that inside yourself and claim that future vision. But it's not just about having the vision, it's about putting the work in too. And I think people who are scared to transition either out of a nine to five or go entrepreneur or whatever they want to do, it's, they're scared because they don't know the next step and they don't have that clear path. But all the successful people you talk to them, they didn't have everything figured out as they were going along the way. They were just figuring it out as they went. They didn't have all the answers. And that's why entrepreneurs are so successful because of all the failures they've had. And people are scared to fail. They're 100% scared to fail because they're scared of the reactions of other people around them. They're scared of the embarrassment. They're scared of the humiliation. But that shit's short term. What's long term is going to be the regret that they're going to have of never making the commitment. So you've got to ask yourself, if you're listening to this and you're in a transition, if you don't know if you want to have a side gig or you want to do it, go all in. But if you're not willing to go all in, give yourself grace on why you're not. But you've got to make the decision on why you're going to do something. You're going to do it and you're going to go all in and the work is going to be required. Having a goal at first is exciting. Hitting the goal is really exciting, but the middle sucks and you got to get through the middle. But that's it's not about the destination. It's about the journey because it's about who you become along the way. I agree with that 100 percent. I mean. I have not been able to scientifically figure it out for myself what happens when someone plants their flag. But I know there are things based on the outcome of other individuals that there is a process that happens in the universe that that does happen. So I haven't been able to quantify it with math, numbers, logical to explain it to somebody else logically prove for them that th it does work. I only have the end result. I can say, hey, listen, this guy planted their flag. 10 years later, look what happened. It's the same thing he said he was going to do 10 years ago. And then now it's worth 50 million, 100 million, 200 million. Or he said he was going to marry this girl and have three kids and live in this place. Look, it happened. He did it. So I don't know what that is, but I know that when you plant the flag, something happens in the universe metaphysically some things line i don't know but it does happen well i would love to touch on that because i speak highly of it to my team so i was a psychology major uh, from penn state university so i am so obsessed with how our brain works and i'm in sales so i'm obsessed with the psychology behind sales and how people react and how people behave but there's something in our brain um it's called the ras have you ever heard of it before yes Okay, so the reticular activating system. It's basically, for anybody who doesn't know about it, who's watching, it is the filter in our brain that tells us when things are important to us. For example, when you buy a new car, let's say you buy a Honda Civic, all right? All of a sudden, you it's start seeing Civics everywhere on the road. Do you know why that is? Because now your brain knows that Honda Civics are important to you. So you start seeing them everywhere. So in order to get your RAS to work for you, to make your dreams and goals and visions a reality, you got to start writing things down every day. I call them my declarations as if they already happened. I write down with my five gratefuls, 10 declarations of who I want to become in the next five to 10 years. 
and all the goals that I want to hit along the way. But all my goals I have written down are goals that I have already happened in my brain. Last year, when we moved to Maryland a year and a half ago, my goal the entire year was to become the number one sales trainer in the entire company out of 8,000 people. So every day I wrote down, I am the number one supervising agent on stage in the Bahamas. The next day, I am the number one supervising agent on stage in the Bahamas. Every day I wrote that down because every morning my brain now started focusing on how to attract those things that I needed to get in my life to make that happen for me. Fast forward to January 2020, I was the number one supervising agent in the entire company out of 8,000 people. But I didn't make that happen by myself. My team made that happen, but I also impacted my team to make such a vision that was such bought in to every single person on that team. But my focus started every single morning by writing that down because I kept my vision at the forefront of my brain. And let me tell you how sweet it was to write cross that thing off on that day that I found out. It was so sweet, so sweet. And you're gonna continue to do this with all those declarations that you write down. And so now I have more, right? I write down every more, I retired my mom. That has always been a goal of mine. I retired my mom and I know for a fact I'm going to do it because it already happened in my brain. My next So car, from the time that you decided that, from the time that, from the time you decided and the time that you crossed it off, how long was that in the process in between? A year and a half. Year and a half. Got it. So year. we're talking about somewhere around 18 months. Got it. Cool. Yep. I wrote it down like 500 and sometimes before it happened. And there's going to be and, and that's the element that a lot of people don't see because a lot of individuals I feel like we set ourselves up for failure when we compare our first step to someone else's 15 20 30 step or me comparing myself with someone who's got experience for more than 10 years in a field and I'm not saying that you can't have these little mini jumps to expedite that process right. and collapse the time frame but I feel like we're just, some people are too hard on themselves that if they don't get it within six months, they're like, oh, see, it, it wasn't meant to be signed from God that said I shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like, uh, this, is, this is not a fair competition that I'm getting into the ring with someone who's been a UFC fighter for 15 years. I just showed up to the gym like, you know, six months ago, all of a sudden thinking I can hang with this guy. That's not a fair competition. Like, I shouldn't be thinking like that. I should give myself a little bit more time to prepare, especially if that's such a big undertaking. That's how I feel about that. I 100% agree. Comparison is the thief of joy. It's the thief of joy. I talk about it because, you know, my audience is a lot of times women. And women compare all day long. It is in our subconscious to compare all day. Oh, well, I'll never be as pretty as her. I'll never be as smart as her. She's only 24 and she has her own house or she's already 30 years old and she has her own car and she's married and kids and I don't have that. Maybe something's wrong with me and they get into their heads and thinking, no, your path is meant for you. And yes, you can't compare someone's 17th mile with your first because you also didn't see all the things that they went through to get to that position. And you absolutely will, but consistency compounds. I talk about this all the time with my team. Like for me, it took me four four years to get that title at my company. Nothing was happening, nothing was happening, nothing was happening. And then boom, everything was happening because that's called consistency and that's when it compounds. It's like a snowball and it starts off really small and it rolls down the hill, but all of a sudden it's huge and it is coming for you at full force and you better watch out. And so people- How's your relationship with the book Think and Grow Rich? Oh, I love Think and Grow Rich. It really spoke to me because I am such a manifester and visualizer that your thoughts truly become your reality. 100%. In the book, Napoleon Hill talks about it, that when the riches come, and a lot of people take the word riches as money, but it has nothing to do with money. Sometimes it could be monetary compensation. Right. But he says that when the riches come, you always wonder where they have been during all those lean years. And I feel like because of the language barrier that a lot of people, we don't speak like that anymore in America. So a lot of people don't understand what those lean years mean. So I literally had to go look at them. I'm like, what is he talking about? But when I understood it, that's exactly what you're talking about. There were a lot of lean years or months before you got to the, the harvest that you needed to, to get. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't look at it like that. So I think it's like a, it needs a little bit of a translation and maybe examples of what that means and how that would happen, then you start, because I think we are a visual 
animals. And if you don't have a picture, uh, that's why vision boards are very important, right. you know? So it's like, and, and I caught myself last week, I have the vision board in the office, but there are days that I don't look at it, even though it's next to my desk. That's because I'm doing a lot of stuff. I know it's there, but I caught myself and I'm like, wow, if I have it within three feet from me and I sometimes miss it, imagine if you don't have one, how often you're missing your right. goals and, and target. I 100% agree. And I think like you said, like with that instant gratification, you know, with people like, think about a farmer. They don't plant a seed today and expect the fruit tomorrow. They know it takes time. It takes love. It takes sunlight. It takes water. It takes patience. It takes growth for these things to happen. And I think this, this day and age, unfortunately, I am, you know, I'm considered a millennial and people have so many bad things to say about millennials. I think we're going to be the best freaking generation ever. But why I believe this is sometimes a negative with us is technology. You know, when your internet is slow just for two seconds, it drives you crazy. And you're like, oh, my God, freaking work. You know, and you're losing your mind. And I think that's the problem is, like, we've, we have so much instant gratification in our life. If we want a snack, there's a microwave. If we want food delivered to our house, there's DoorDash. Like, there's so many easy conveniences and easy way outs. And I think people need to realize you can't shortcut anything. When you shortcut, you get cut short. There's no secret to how people get to where they got to go. There's no one little piece of thing that it's like, everyone's always like, okay, maybe if he just tells me this, then I'll get to here. But it's not only about the one little thing that everyone is doing. It's a multitude of things. And it takes years to get to that. And I hate that when people ask that, what is the, what is the secret? And I'm like, so finally I started lying. I started telling people, I'm going to tell you what the secret is. And then I tell them all the processes. And they're like, so what's the secret? I'm like, the whole thing. Because they kept asking, what's the secret? I'm like, you know, I get that on Instagram. They're like, what's the secret to grow your, your audience? And I'm like, it's like 50 different things that you got to do on a consistent basis for three years. Yeah. And you're asking me, what is that one secret? I don't know. And then when I say, I don't know, they think like I'm playing hard to get. And I'm not saying right. it. So I was like, that's weird. I can't say I don't know. I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell you the secret. You need to do this. So now I'm got, I got a list, but everybody's looking for that shortcut. And I don't mean that there are not shortcuts for each processes that you put in place for your business. But overall, listen, if there was a shortcut, other people would have been doing it. So, And honestly, I'm going to keep it real. That's why 5% of America makes six figures or more and 95% doesn't. Because it's not about finding the secret. It's about doing what the 95% aren't willing to do. It's about the and that's knowledge. Taking, and that's taking punches in the face and laying down on your behind uh, every other day if you're in business. So that's what a lot of people are afraid of getting those punches. Rejections, objections, no's, yeses, all of these different things. Things not going right, putting out fires, or things costing more, costing less having a whole entire Corona COVID-19 app, like all of these things. But I feel like as long as you're pushing forward, I think everything works out. And, and here's another thing that I want to mention and I want to get your opinion. Mm -hmm. Isn't it better to make 80,000, but be happy versus making 150,000 and then not happy? Well, I think you can debate this all day, you know, depending on people. But I'm, I'm asking you. People say, some people say money is the root of all evil. Some people say money impacts who you actually were, negative or positive. And I'm the type that believes we are happier when we make more money. I believe more money makes somebody happier. Now, they can also be completely miserable in their life, but it's not the money that's causing them to be miserable. It's something in their life that's causing them to be miserable maybe it's their family or maybe it's their relationships or maybe it's because they've never had that sense of connection with somebody you know the six needs of people maybe they don't have the love and connection maybe they do have the certainty factor because they're making that much money but they don't have uncertainty in their life anymore so like i truly believe that when you make more money that's why all the girls date all the crazy ones in high school but then when they get older they want to go for the stable guy yeah absolutely so i think making more money can make you a happier person 
but I don't believe money can make you miserable. I believe there's something in your life that's already miserable and it's not coming from the money. Because when you make more money, you can provide a better doctor for your mother. When you make more money, you can provide better education for your family. When you make more money, you can give back more to your community. So I believe it can impact more. And it's, it's a tool. It's how you use the tool. Somebody use a knife to do harm to somebody. Somebody use the same knife to heal somebody. So to me, it's like, yeah. It, it's a tool you got to do. But... Speak that fire, but he speak that fire. That was good. I like that one liner. I'm going to have to put it in my back pocket for later. <laughs> no, I mean, but, but I mean, think about it. It's like, I do, I do look at it as a tool. Right. But then I also see, because I'm like 20, 30 minutes away from Beverly Hills. And I got to tell you, a lot of people in U.S. think Beverly Hills is a happy, yandy, awesome place. It's not. There is more drugs. More, more sexual harassment, more divorces, more of all of these things, plus good stuff. You know, it's not just negative. But there is a lot of these different things that are happening that a lot of these people are well off. But they're using those tools to try to make themselves happy. But I don't think it takes money to be happy. I think with more money, you could do more things that give you the fulfillment. Because the fact that you know that you could take care of your mom, it's not about the better doctor. It's, yeah, you could do that. But the fact that you have the control, that you right. show muscles, you're like, okay, you know, go to the best doctor. Don't worry about the bill. Get the best guy to do this thing, right? So that gives you the fulfillment that you're like, okay, I am the shit. Like, okay, I took care of this thing and I could handle it, right? So I think the way you use it and you, you apply the money to the needs that you have on on your daily basis makes a big difference. But a lot of those rich folks have drug problems. They have, you know, they're not happy with who they are. And I always say, doesn't matter what kind of a house you live in. At, at the end of the day, it's you living in it. So doing a different remodeling to the kitchen, if you're an unhappy person, you still are the same person that's going to be in that renewed kitchen. But yep. I don't know. I 100%. I guess we could debate about that, you know. We should have a we should have a session, and I tell you where I got my research from. Me and my wife, we went back and forth. We had this debate for for a while, and she, I went to regular public school, like right. maybe the ghetto. You could say the ghetto. I went to like one of the toughest neighborhoods and everything else, but I was part of the magnet program. I went to school with some bunch of nerds, right? We didn't do all the crazy things that other people did. So for me, it was like. It was good school. It, it did what it was supposed to do. My wife went to all girls, private school, Catholic, all girls school, all of that private, private, the whole shebang, right? And we were talking about it, and the number that I came up with was 250000 Your lifestyle does not improve much, anything beyond two fifty. Anything beyond two fifty per year, the quality of your life doesn't get any better, but you could do more things with more money. But I figured that 250 was the benchmark. That you gotta get to 250 and then anything after that, you're the decision maker on that. But you gotta be part of that 5% that you mentioned. Because when you sit down with those people, the conversations are different. Yeah, absolutely. And at the end of the day, you don't wanna be in the room that, that you make the most money in. You know, I wanna be in the room where I'm the one who's the most broke because I can learn something from those people. I never want to be in the room where I'm the smart or the most intelligent on the subject because I want to learn and grow because I am such a growth mindset in person. You know, I don't think that all the knowledge I have right now is all the knowledge I'm ever going to have or the person I am right now is not the person I'm going to be. You know, I did, I grew up in a fixed mindset family, very fixed mindset family, you know, where how it was is how it was always going to be. And people worked until they were 65 and then you retired with a $2,000 pension and then you tried to live your life and then you got health issues then you died. That is not the freaking American dream that my ancestors came over from Lithuania a hundred and some years ago to come over here to America to give me that kind of dream. And that's why I truly believe in the entrepreneurship mindset because I know by the time I'm 40, if I want to retire, I can. And now I'm 40 and I'm not waiting till I'm 65 to do it. There's another way, but I think the 95% of America don't know how to find the other way because they don't know where it exists. Right. It's called Google. Hello, people. It's called Google. It's this free tool on the internet. If you don't know how to do something, you write it in there and boom, you can find anything you want there. 
So we need to start using our resources in a more powerful way. Because when you do have more knowledge, it's not just knowledge is power, but it's how you implement the knowledge you learn to create a bigger impact. Yeah, just go on Instagram and find a mentor. Uh, have some, somebody else has done it before you. Stop, stop trying to figure things out. You know, if, if yeah. I'm trying to get into business, I'm going to come and say, okay, Eric, just show me. What's up? What do I got to do? But then I got to be open-minded. I got to be coachable. I got to listen. I got to put in the work. I got to do all that stuff. I got to go through the hardships that you go into building anything. Listen, raising children is not easy. There's a lot of hardship that comes. You get the enjoyment, but it's not easy, right? Someone like if people have been knowing for thousands of years, it's possible. Find a good parent, learn from them, phone call five minutes every day. You improve after five years. You're the best daddy that lived on this planet. And nobody needs to know you got the coaching from them. But you made that phone call every day. And you need to ask the right people the right questions. Like, I love my mom to death. Love her to death. But I'm not going to ask her for relationship advice because she was divorced. I'm not going to go ask somebody who was 300 pounds for fitness advice. So I want to find the best answers from the people who have become experts in those fields. And when you finally get the time to be with those people, do not, if you're watching this, do not ask them how you did it. Instead, ask them what their next move is. Ask them where they're going next. Because everyone wants to know how they did it. No, ask them where they're going next. Let them speak to you. No one ever asked them that. There's a little tip for you. Stick it in your back pocket. Use it. And number two, don't ask them to give you all the tips and tricks and everything that they've done because they worked really freaking hard to get into that position. And I know from my standpoint, because before I was number one in my company, only people that knew me were really in my agency because I was top of my agency, but not top international. But now that I'm top international, everyone wants every single tool, trick, thing in my tool belt. And at the end of the day, I will give you my feedback and I will give you my advice, but you got to work for it. I'm not giving you everything I did because that discredits what I did behind the scenes and the work that I put into it. And by you getting all the tips and tricks from them and everything you can possibly do, you're becoming an energy vampire and draining them. They will give you the feedback and they'll give you the advice, but it's up to you to implement it. So like back to stop asking for shortcuts, stop asking for the easy way out. When you find a really good mentor in your life, you stick with them, but you also give back to them as much as you, they're giving to you. 100%. I agree with that 100%. Listen, I want to thank you so much for taking it. How do people find you? They can find me on Instagram. That's my biggest platform, at Erica, E-R-I-C-A, double underscore. So Erica, underscore, underscore, Robertson. Robertson, like Duck Dynasty people. Erica, underscore, underscore, Robertson. Give me a follow. Follow me. Let me know that you saw this. You know, slide in the DMs. Let me know what you thought about it. Would love the feedback. You know, I do consulting for a lot of people for the sales industry. You know, the psychology behind the sales. Heart, re hardwiring sales professionals' brains to get out of their own way and to get to that next level of peak performance. So if that's somebody like you or you just want to level up in your life, I can get you to that position. So reach out to me and I can definitely help you to get you where you want to go. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll make sure the team edits the video and put it back on, on IGTV so we could uh, tag you on it so you'll definitely be able to. Thank you so much for taking this time. Stay Thanks. safe. We'll talk soon. Yes, you too. Thanks so much. Take care. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.